Hey everybody, Asher here, and this is Essential Topics in Final Fantasy 1 Randomizer, a guide series that pretty much breaks down the game from people who maybe don't have a lot of experience with Final Fantasy or the randomizer to kind of bridge the gap of knowledge and just kind of put it all into one place. I know some people really like written guides, and there's a lot of written guides out there, but some people prefer videos, so that's what I'm doing here today. This guide assumes that you have a working knowledge of the original game of Final Fantasy, not like expert knowledge, but just a working knowledge, and not necessarily any knowledge of the randomizer. So what we're going to be doing today in this video is doing a brief overview of every single one of the flags here, just so that you know what it means so you can create whatever kind of game you want to. This can be found at FinalFantasyRandomizer.com. That's why I left the address bar up here. So what you're going to need to do if you do want to play a game of Final Fantasy 1 Randomizer, the only thing you require is you can go to this website. You can see this is the 2.5.1 Randomizer. This is the live version. There's alpha and betas floating around, but this is the standard one that people use for tournaments. Um, you will need a Final Fantasy ROM. I cannot help you there. But .NES is what you need, which is why I have it there. And then you can go to the website. There is a web client as well, but I prefer the website. Most people use the website. But what you end up doing and how this works, if you played other randomizers, you might have been able to see it before. You have a seed here, which you can see that is in the address bar. If I click New Seed, that changes it up there, changes it up there. So it'll randomly generate a seed, or you can put in a sort of hexadecimal or six, base 16 uh, thing, and it'll work out that way. And then you have your flags. This is a fairly long flag string for people who may or may not recognize it. And there are some presets if you want to play a certain way, such as the default kind of understood uh, things. You can do an improved vanilla that only turns on the conveniences and the bug fixes, which we'll get to in a little bit. But we're going to focus on looking kind of at the beginner flag set that's at least listed here. And there's maybe even some tweaks you could suggest trying to get to sort of your own understanding of Final Fantasy Randomizer and how you want to play it. So I'm trying, I'm going to try and keep this as brief as I can, but there's a lot to go over. So let's dive in. There are a number of tabs that you have to go through here. Shuffle, Treasures, Goal, Map, Scale, Party, Conveniences, Bug Fixes, Fun Percent. We're going to go through all of them. It's going to take a little bit, but like I said, this is the, this is the meat and potatoes of what you need to know how to make this work. Starting with, you can shuffle shops in Final Fantasy Randomizer. That means uh, any sort of weapon shops, armor shops, item shops. You can include random weapons and armor if you want to instead of just what's in the store. You can also include caster items and elite gear. So if you want Mazamune or Excalibur to appear in the store, that's how you do that. You can also shuffle the magic levels, which means that you can get nuke at level one, but you can also shuffle the magic shops, which means that you can have level eight spells appearing in the first town of Canaria and level one spells appearing in Gaia. Keeping permissions is another flag. I don't see it used very often, but pretty much there's a few spells that are always locked out. And this is where video editing would be nice instead of trying to do it in one take but we're gonna try this one more time i will be running some chaos rush after this but let me try this one more time just hang on
let's try this again hopefully one take hopefully allergies will stop affecting my nose and i won't have to clean out all the garbage that's in there because where i live uh, the pollen counts pretty much off the scale today Hey everybody, this is Asher with Essential Topics and Final Fantasy 1 Randomizer, a guide that pretty much goes through a series of steps to kind of introduce you to Final Fantasy 1 Randomizer. This guide assumes that you have a working knowledge of the game but don't necessarily know the randomizer, so I'm going to be going through with this video as well as a few other videos to kind of break down the game, to kind of get you up to speed. Some people prefer written guides, personally I prefer written guides, and there's a lot of good written guides and resources out there but I know some people prefer video guides and that's kind of a hole that I haven't seen somebody just sit down and break down things so that's my goal in this and other videos so there's a lot to cover in this one because today we are talking about the randomizer itself and all the features that are in there so I'm just gonna go ahead dive in get started we are using the FF1 randomizer 2.5.1 the web client which you can see the web address up here so you can go to this. There is an offline client as well. I prefer the online one. Most people use it anyway. And if you hear cats in the background running around, we'll just we'll just deal with that as we go. But if you do want to play Final Fantasy 1 Randomizer, you need the website and you need a ROM. I cannot help you to get a ROM, but it does need to be a .NES. That's fine. This one works. And when you go to the website, you'll see if you've used other randomizers, some of them are similar, some of them are different from this but pretty much this is a seed based you can click a new seed and you can see every time I click that it changes the web address up here so you can link this web address to whatever there is a series of flags you'll see this change as we kind of go through and mess with this and then once you get the settings that you like you click randomize download a new modified file of that NES ROM and that's what you play so those logistics out of the way let's go ahead and talk about all of the buttons that are on here i'm going to try and go through this as fast as i can but i want to make sure i take the time to explain it as well so this is going to be a little longer than maybe some of the other videos but i haven't seen a walkthrough all in one place so let's go there are a few presets if you want to use them that way and you'll see the flags will change every time i click on these sort of the default settings there's even improved vanilla where if you don't want to randomize anything you just want all the conveniences and bug fixes and possibly fun percent you can do that there is advanced NPC shuffle there is beginner flags and we can talk about kind of what some settings you may want to run if you're starting out or there's a lot of people in the Final Fantasy 1 randomizer discord who are happy to kind of help you tweak what you want to do but I'm gonna be going based off of the beginner and we'll talk about what each and every single one of these buttons means and there's a lot so let's get right to it your first tab is your shuffle tab this is what kind of mixes things up and makes the randomizer very special very interesting and very different from a lot of the other randomizers that I see. It's where Final Fantasy 1, I really, I really like it because of the variety from game to game. The shop one is not too surprising. Weapon shops, armor shops, item shops. You click this, they change around. They're not in the default uh, Final Fantasy 1 NES game. You can also include random and weapons and armor, such as like flame armor, ice sword, uh, or anything like that. But you can also include caster items and elite gear. So if you want the power bonk to be in the store or even possibly Mazamine or Excalibur you can click those as well just to kind of power up your shops there is also magic levels being shuffling so if or being ability to be shuffled such as if you want level one nuke that's how you can get level one nuke or level two cure four those will be placed around there is also the magic shop shuffle which is a very difficult increase or difficulty increase spike because that can make level eight magic that you can't learn appear in the level one town or make level two magic that you might want especially if nuke is level two but it's in gaia because you click this on keeping permissions is another feature that i don't see too many people use but there are spells in the vanilla um Final Fantasy 1, such as Warp, for instance, that aren't learnable until Clash Change or aren't learnable by certain casters at all. This holds those permissions, whereas if you keep them unchecked, it goes strictly on the spell slot where it appears in the store, such as slot 2 and slot 4, White Magic of level 1 not being Red Mage learnable. You don't know all that yet, it's okay, but it's just knowledge that you'll gain as you play it more. Another thing you can shuffle, though, is item magic. You may be familiar with things like the Defense Sword casting Ruse, the power gauntlet casting saber thor hammer casting lit too if you shuffle item magic suddenly you could get a fade hammer or you could get a lamp staff or an x for helmet it can really make the game very different especially when some strategies rely on something like the defense sword or the power gauntlet 
The other thing on this side, these are all very important shuffles that, well, you may or may not be familiar with. The first is enemy scripts. Each enemy in this game, in Final Fantasy 1, has a certain set of actions. You click this button on, and that's how you get imps with nuke. Now, there is an additional flag here that was set on because of tournament stuff last year, where if you want to click on unsafe pirates, and you'll see this little warning that says, uh-oh, risk nine pirates with thunder blocking early progression. That's how it used to be, but if you toggle this off, then pirates are never going to be something that will wipe you. The pirates and provoke a Bicky's buddies, I mean. Um, enemy skills and spells. Well, that's technically how you get imps with nuke. This is how you get different combat order, things like that. Enemy status attacks, such as if you want death touch wolves. That's a fun thing to run into. Enemy unrunnable formations. Fortunately, uh, it doesn't show run for every time now. Now in the 2.5.1 randomizer, and for a little while since or previously. If you can't run from a, a fight, you have the option to wait instead. So you'll know what those unrunnable encounters are. If you played Final Fantasy 1, you know certain encounters are unrunnable, like wizards. That changes. Enemy first strike chance, sort of same thing. Just changing the ambush rate, switching that around. You could have suddenly ambush happy enemies that maybe weren't ambush happy before. This drop down menu is a little bit interesting because it's not a checkbox, but you can not sh you can do the not shuffling encounter, so you get kind of the same encounters around the world like you normally would. You could shuffle the encounter rarity, which I see pretty often, such as maybe having T Rexes or War Max appear more often, but it's random. Shuffle all encounters across zones, and then randomize encounter zones. Those sort of have similar effects that go about different ways, but that can have suddenly uh, sea shrine enemies appearing in your walk to temple of fiends the first time which is very exciting forced enemy encounter tiles if you shuffle those suddenly you can have the eye tile and the agma tile the agma tile and the wizard tile and everything gets thrown around the world you could have a blue dragon on a trap tile in temple of fiends if you use random formations though there is a whole set of enemy formations they're called the b-side formations that are not used in the default game but are in the game's memory. Random Formations opens that up so that you can suddenly have a triple I tile, a multiple red dragon tile, those kind of things, pretty juicy. And then the RNG table, that's available even at the beginning or on the beginner level. That means that your walk around the world and any of those sort of random things, that's that's kind of where it starts. You, it's going to be shuffled every time you roll a seed. It's not just going to be the same every time. So that's the shuffling. This is very important to learn and understand, but as you play Siege, you can start with less and click on more and see if you like it. Treasures! We all like treasure. There are three different treasure things to get to, so let's go at them all at once. Item shuffle. First off, this moves treasures around different treasure chests. If you randomize the treasures, that means that suddenly we're taking out, okay, instead of maybe a light axe being here, we're going to switch it with something else. Well, if it checks, see, we have for some mouse over some alt text here. Randomizes the contents of all non-progression, non-incentivized items, weapons, and gear. We'll talk about what incentivized means in a little bit, especially if you're not familiar with randomizer. That's pretty important to know. And then wealth. You can have high wealth, which means very valuable items. That can get you more than your three ribbons in the world if you want to. Going all the way to impoverished and then Melmond. If you don't know what Melmond is, it's a great place to visit in the summer. We'll talk about some other Melmond-specific flags later, but high to below impoverished. NPC item shuffle is interesting. If unchecked, forces vanilla bridge, loot, ship, rod, canoe, cube, and bottle. So that means that when you talk, if you uncheck it, you get your default text. The king gives you a bridge every time. The princess gives you the loot, etc. You check it, and that suddenly switches around. It sort of makes the randomizer what you've probably seen on YouTube or Twitch. Best quest rewards, if unchecked, forces vanilla, crystal, herb, key, chime, and Excalibur. That means that if you want to have the adamant turn into the cube, you click this. And then you can also incentivize the fetch quest NPCs. We'll talk about what that means in just a moment. So if you're just starting out, I would definitely not click this yet. But it is something that you want to move into because that's uh, how a lot of people who do play, play this game play. Objective NPCs is a newer flag. Not a lot of people use it, but that can put Bahamut and Melmond, which we all know and love. But it could put Dr. Un in a place where maybe you can't get to him until the airship, or you can't turn in the herb until you can get to Melmond. It moves them around. 
it's, it's pretty interesting. The next two are very much linked together, incentivized locations and incentivized items. An incentivized item is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with the right here, an incentivized item is something that the game says, okay, this has to appear and you may need it for progression. Your standard ones are the things that you need to get the orbs, things like, or things you need to win the game, like key, like oxio, like cube, like chime. So those are your basic standard, your slate of progression items to get through the game that are incentivized. But you can click some others. You note that tail doesn't have to be. And we say other quest items here. Other not require quest items like the ruby, adamant, crystal, TNT, herb, etc. But then we also have incentivized. You can incentivize the Mazmune, which means that the Mazmune is potentially going to appear from one of these incentivized locations. This is how you make a seed so that it draws you to a certain place. Like in the base game, one of the most treacherous parts of the entire run is getting the floater from the ice cave. Well, maybe you don't want the floater chest to be an incentivized location, or you do want it to be. It doesn't have to be the floater. It could be the ribbon. It could be an opal bracelet, power gauntlet, Thor hammer, any of those. So you can check, you can check all of these out. You'll notice that these are clumped in terms of these are not uh, locations that are you required to go through to light orbs. These are locations you're required to go through to light orbs. The ice cave is the floater chest. Ordeals is the tail chest. Marsh cave is the one that's guarded by the wizards that I think is TNT. I should really know that. The earth cave is the ruby chest. And see, we have alt text for all these crown chests. See, that's what I get. So earth cave is the ruby chest that's behind the vampire. Volcano is the floor west of where the red dragon chest is, so it's the room above Carrie. The sea shrine is the slab chest where the mermaids are. Sky palace is the adamant chest on the little spider room, uh, eight path room, any of that. And then you have your two potential lock chests, which means you need to key to get them, which is the TNT chest in Canaria. See, that's what I get for not remembering these things. I played the randomizer too long. And the bottom right marsh locked chest. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that if you're playing uh, fetch quest rewards and you don't incentivize fetch quest NPCs, that's going to make what is a called a bunch of loose items. That loose items are something you really want to be mindful of when you're creating flags or playing flags. And there's some more detailed explanations I can do, but for the basis of this video, just know that if you have more than one or two loose items, that means you're going to be searching a lot of treasure chests around the world to try and find these items to turn in to potentially win the game. And maybe that's what you want. It's cool if you do. But if you're going to be just playing the beginner, I would say just start with something like this. You see the beginner flags have a lot of incentivized locations to let you go through the world as maybe you're used to playing it. And then more importantly, if you go through the incentivized locations, you should get a Mazamune. You should get a ribbon. Next, goal. Three different little things for goals this is all just starting to fundamentally change uh, the, the first two tabs are just kind of like okay here's final fantasy let's hit it with a hammer these three turn it on its head quite a bit first chaos rush a format that i personally enjoy pretty much this means that combined with free orbs it'll let you visit the temple of fiends completely unlocked from the very beginning of the game so you start without a mystic key you start or you don't need a mystic key to get to chaos you start with the loot which means you can go straight in free orbs means that your orbs are already lit so if you combine these together you can go straight into the temple of fiends revisited fun times until you get hit by worms with nuke treasure hunt this is another format that's pretty popular it was actually one of these uh tournaments last winter that involved a treasure hunt which means that instead of collecting four orbs you now have a bunch of tiny shards or chunks or something else spread around the world. If you play Treasure Hunt, there's 16 of them. If you add extra treasure, there is about 35, I think, put around the world, but you need 24 to 30. Keep in mind that if you're playing a Treasure Hunt, killing Lich or Carry gives you two shards, chunks, whatever. Kraken and Tiamat give you four. And then you can go into the Temple of Fiends. But let's say you don't want to play a super long multi-floor Temple of Fiends. You could do shortened Temple of Fiends Revisited, which means that you start straight on Chaos's floor. But if you want to give yourself a little bit of a challenge, you can put 
trap tiles down there so that the four fiends are also on Chaos's floor. If you go right, you might face two. If you go left, you might face two. But they're trap tiles, which means you can run over them again and just, I guess, farm Kraken too if you really want to. The other thing, and this one, it should have a little warning box here because alternate final boss instead of fighting chaos you can fight something else now i'm not going to spoil it for you in case you do want to play it if you've watched any of the chaos rush tournament you already know what potential it is but generally speaking not always but generally speaking the alternate final bosses can be way more difficult than chaos so just keep that in mind next is the map edits the map everything else this is interesting. You'll see the beginner set doesn't have a lot of changes to this. These are things that you want to get into maybe when you have a little bit more understanding or game knowledge. For entrance, entrance shuffle. Suddenly, when you enter Matoya's cave, it could be the sea shrine. Isn't that fun? Town shuffle. If you've watched Jire, he plays with town shuffle a lot, then you know that suddenly instead of Provoka and level 2 magic, you might find Lafane and no magic. The other fun way to play though, which involves a lot of note taking, is that you have entrances, so suddenly your Matoy's Cave becomes Sea Shrine, but then we make it so that the floors are shuffled, which means that you might start on the third floor of Sea Shrine and have to work your way through to somewhere in Sky Castle, then Mirage Temple. Uh, pretty much the only places that are not going to be shuffled are the Temple of Fiends Revisited and Castle Ordeals. If there's something else I forgot, I'm sorry. Um, Deep Topher is another flag for this, which pretty much means that Tof Temple of Fiends and Temple of Fiends Revisited does not have to appear on the top floor, such as going into like Sardis Cave and its Temple of Fiends. It could be five floors deep, which is exactly what the warning says there. So it's an interesting way to play, but a very different way to play. If you don't take notes, it really taxes your brain. Uh, map edits. Some of these are a little bit more meme than others, but some of these are very important to the fact that we're going to start with the bottom and work our way up. Open progression adds some different movement that maybe you've seen in the randomizer but may not remember in the base game. Open progression, probably the most important ones, is that you can walk from Carnaria Castle to the Dwarf Cave via some mountains to the west, or to the if you go west instead of straight north of Temple of Fiends. Then it also includes an additional river system, that lets you go from Provoka straight down to Crescent Lake by canoe, where typically there's a river system that goes to Ice Cave and a river system that goes to Volcano. Open progression adds that in. In addition, open progression also puts a dock outside of Onrak, so you can take a boat to Onrak. Extended open progression makes it even more fun because suddenly you have a dock that's also outside of the airship desert and excuse me, open progression also puts a uh, dock outside of the desert where the uh, Mirage Tower is. So extended open progression adds to this quite a bit, and it means that pretty much you can go around the world however you want. And I apologize, actually, because now I'm trying to remember which one of these unlocks the Mirage and which one of these doesn't. But the big thing about extended open progression is that it adds a... Uh, area where you go to the airship desert you can get there by boat without needing a canoe also it adds a and i hate that my brain is trying to flick off on this but it adds a little gap in the river system north of the northwest castle which means that open progression that you have from uh Carneria to the dwarf cave now you can walk from the dwarf cave down to northwest castle down the marsh down to <coughs> and I really apologize for the allergies there down to Elfland so this makes the world a lot more open you can see the beginner flags turn all those off because it's trying to keep you in a narrow space but these are two of the ones you want to first start playing with okay other things here castle ordeal pillars in case you never knew in the base game for castle ordeals you want to take the bottom pillar every time click this on and then suddenly it's a pillar maze of course, if you have warp, you can just go ahead and cast warp and go back every time. It's a lot of fun. Sky Castle Floor 4 Teleporters, in case you didn't know, in the base game, it is a grid. And if you go to the two to the right and two up, or two to the left and two up, or two to the left, two down, etc., you'll get from one transporter to another. This is my personal least favorite flag to turn on because it turns that endless sort of Sky Castle maze into literally the 
exit is in a random location. Sometimes it's right next to you, sometimes you gotta search. Titan's Trove, you'll see that this one's on even in the beginners. This moves the Titan a little bit to the west, so you cannot cheese by getting an early airship and walking behind where the Titan is. This means you have to have the ruby to get those four chests. Confused Old Men means that you know the Circle of Sages, how they stay in a circle? Well, this when you click this on, they're walking around. So it's still one of them is very random. Or it's not very random, it's 1 in 12. You just don't know which one is walking around that has one of these key items. Which, they are a main quest NPC. They give the canoe by default. So that's Confused Old Men means you, get to, you have a 1 in 12 chance of talking to people. And usually for me, it's number 11 or number 12 that I talk to. Zozo Melmond, if you've played uh, Final Fantasy VI, you know what Zozo is. It's where enemies will attack you when you're walking around town. You click on Zozo Melmond. Uh... A few different enemy formations, mostly lower level uh, undead and pirates, will attack you if you go off the road in Melman. So any of the paved tile paths are safe. Anywhere else you can get attacked, such as trying to talk to Dr. Um. And then finally, War Mech. If you don't just want War Mech on the Bridge of Destiny, you can change it from vanilla to patrolling, which means that he's walking around somewhere in the Sky Castle maze room and you can talk to him and take a fight, or required, which is exactly what it sounds like. You can't get to Tiamat until you go through the war mech. So have fun with that one. Scaling. Scaling is one of the things that most often this page gets overlooked because people, everyone's going to have their preferences for scaling and how easy or how difficult they want their game to be. So I will let you kind of tweak these and figure it out yourself, but most of them are pretty self-explanatory. You have your prices which can go from 50% uh, to 200% so something could either be that's base 100 gold could be 50 gold or 200 gold extrapolate that how you will it's the same way with enemy stats and this is not ev this is not like one roll okay your imp is 77% of an imp no it's one stat could be 77% it could have 77% of its attack it could have 130% of its um, absorb and you can move this all the way up to 500 percent not recommended for beginners but you can if you want to same with boss stats you can move it all the way up and down these little check boxes here uh they're not as popular as maybe they were when they were first introduced but it's still an interesting way to play if you want to this messes with the law of averages you notice as we go up here that it's like okay you could have a boss that has 20 percent of its base hp up to 500 percent if you hit this button that clamps it to a minimum of 100. So it's always gonna have at least base stats. It makes the game a lot harder. Even like, <coughs> even like clamped 100 to 160 makes the game a lot harder. But play with it if you want to. Shop prices clamped, one of the great ways to troll your friends if you wanna do it that way. Experience and gold boost. This is an interesting flag set that's changed just a little bit for uh, two reasons here. If you go 1x, that's default experience. You can move it all the way up to every encounter. It gives you five times the normal experience. And then gold boost is per enemy killed on the screen. You get an additional zero all the way up to 500. And then you have the potential for experience gold progressive scaling. On the basic one, on the beginner one, it's disabled. But you can do it one of two ways. You can do a flat rate like every key item you get. Once again, key items... Things like the loot, things like the floater. However, key items are not the same as incentivized items. Mazmune, ribbon, opal bracelet, those don't work. But 5% all the way up to 20%, or you can do it where if you get 12 or 15 key items, then you get a flat boost, such as like 200% increased experience at 12 key items. Uh, the overworld and dungeon encounter rates you can drop them down to practically nothing you can move them all the way up to 1.5 most people keep these pretty close to the vest and everyone's going to have their preference just know that if you put a flag set to have like one point or 20 percent extra encounters you're going to feel it and you're going to feel it pretty hard now another thing that's important to keep in mind are these check boxes over here and these are often ignored but do not lose sight of them Restart overflow at one. Instead of clamping, allow overflow values to go at one. 
such as, oh, wow, the computer can no longer, or the CPU, or bleh, I'm talking about a ROM like it's a PC thing. But the game cannot comprehend how high the attack for Kraken rolled. Well, congratulations, it goes back to practically nothing, kind of like the opposite of the Civ Civilization Gandhi nuclear thing. Uh, randomizing the morale... If you want to uncheck it, you can get vanilla morale for all enemies. Checking it means that maybe your um, chaos suddenly has a 2 morale and runs away when you're level 30. Uh, I don't know if it's exactly that extreme, but that's the idea. Includes starting gold. Another good way to troll your friends is that by default you start with 400 gold. You click this, suddenly you might have to punch a few imps outside of Carnaria before you can afford to stay at the end. Okay, it shouldn't be that bad, but it could be. And then static X EXP distribution... One of the common tactics, if you're familiar with any kind of Final Fantasy runs, is to have uh, kill off some of your party members so that you have more experience flowing to your other party members who are alive, such as the solo black belt strategy, where you kill off the rest of your party members, get your black belt to level 32 or 42, and punch the heavens. If you turn on static experience distribution, that experience is still getting split whether or not your people are alive or dead, so you might as well run a party of four. Speaking of party, here's your people, these six classes in Final Fantasy. You can change it if you want to click this, such as you can only choose between a white mage and thief as your first party member. Obviously, you can move them around once the game starts. Another way to do it is that if you want the game to decide, you can force one of these. And the game will automatically decide. You can even do four forced party members if you want to. Uh, one other fun thing that you also see from time to time is some people will select a nun character. Or if you've watched Chaos Rush Tournament, uh, there is one nun that is forced. That means you have three party members and all that entails. So yeah, if you want to try it, just play with it and see. But this is you can control what your party members start as. However, you cannot have it so that it starts with higher... Uh, like upgraded classes like the Master, the Ninja, the Knight. Those are just little graphical things. Conveniences. Conveniences are great. There's been a lot of development that's gone on for a very long time in Final Fantasy 1 Randomizer. So let's just break these down as best as possible. There's some technical issues with these in terms of like a more detailed explanation. I'm going to keep it short because I feel like I've run longer than I meant to already, but that's okay. Hopefully this is helpful to somebody. Uh, conveniences. Early Sarda item. You don't have to kill the vampire. You can go if you find Sarda, you can get an item from Sarda. Sages. You don't have to kill Lich, which is how it is in the base game. The sages will give you an item. Early ordeals. You don't need the crown to go into ordeals. So if you click those, that opens up where you go to the game earlier. No party shuffle. Speed hacks, identify treasure, enable dash, buy ten items. Change unrunnable to from run to wait. That's on by default. You want that on. And critical hit count display. Those are all things that have been programmed into the game to make it easier for you to play, to make it easier for you to go around. The ones that I think are most important to me are the speed hacks because that lets you run around the world faster, much faster than the base game. Identifying treasures, which means that if your inventory is full and you can't open up a treasure chest, it doesn't say your inventory is full. It says the treasure chest has something in it, and maybe you don't want it because it's an iron helmet. It'll pop that up. Maybe it's a Mazamune, and you're like, okay, I need to ditch something from my inventory. That's nice. Buying 10 items instead of one at a time saves a lot of shopping time. Um, the run to wait is one of my favorite changes here. But let me go over to this real quick. These are other conveniences that are pretty, pretty big. Starting with the free airship, drops it right outside the front of the castle, just like where you started the game. That means you can fly anywhere if you played Final Fantasy Free Enterprise. Same idea. Free bridge means that you don't have to fight Garland very first thing. It means you can walk over to Provoka. Free canal, which was added in the 2.5.1, means that you don't need to get the canal, which you could find in a treasure chest in the randomizer, or by default turning in the TNT. That means it's there all the time. And the way the randomizer works, that means that a lot of items that you need for progression could be boat locked, but because the canal is open, it could be potentially anywhere in the world. And then easy mode, I don't recommend this even if you're just starting out because it limits how you learn, but if you just want to test and see how some flags might look, easy mode's a good way to maybe run through the world. It cuts the encounter rate to 20% and all enemy and HP cut to 10%. 
like I said, it, it makes the game pretty much just a walkthrough. And if that's what you need, that's fine. I don't recommend it, but that's this is your this is your time to play, not mine. Bug fixes. House and these are all bugs in the base game that have been changed. If you're familiar with the bugs in the NES version of Final Fantasy, this should work out for you to understand. House MP restoration. Uh, that wasn't working in the base game. It works now every single time, regardless of when you save or set or anything like that. Weapon stats. Some people uh, that I've watched play really like this to be unchecked and like it to be linked to the index number of the original programming here. What this does in essence is make the Vorpal Sword a lot stronger and the Excalibur much weaker. But yeah, Excal is still good, just not necessarily end game, run through the rest of the game good chance to run uh the thief now has a use again because uh, in the nes original game the thief's run chance was broken this fixes that spell fixes there's a number of fixes including lock lock to heal to temper saber cure for out of battle and you can cancel out of exit and warp which is very important because i've accidentally lost to the exit and warp boss too many times to count enemy status attacks will actually land and hit Black Belt and Master Absorb calculation. How it's how it was ideally supposed to work is that if you don't want your Black Belt equipped, you could uh, he'll get Absorb equal to his level, and that could work out pretty well. But if you uncheck this, there's some technical things that change around, and it gets a little bit messy or screwy. It's probably better to play this on. But if you know how to manipulate things and don't want to go back to the armor screen and exploit. The old bugs, that's how some people like to play too. Once again, it's up to you. Um, enemy elemental resistances, those were not all working, and that's why some spells were kind of garbage and others not. Oh, I apologize for the cough again. Enemy spells targeting allies, kind of the same idea here where there's just some AIs that got fixed, and then improved turn order randomization. Um, it just pretty much, I think the way I've seen Nitz, one of the developers, explain it before, is that the original game kind of had the thumb on the scales and his goal was to make it a little bit more actually random in terms of who goes in order first with some factors in mind. Finally, fun percent flags. These do not change really anything about how the game plays. Uh, if you want the original enemy names, and I would honestly suggest checking these two off until you're more familiar with the game, this changes some of the enemy names to like sort of more meme names or anything like that. Like instead of wolves, they're roo -roo 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 -roos. or instead of slimes, they're metal slimes. Palette swap changes how the enemies look. So sometimes your gas dragons um, will not look like gas dragons. Your blue dragons might look red, etc. I do like the modern battlefield better, but if you like the everything window boxed in the combat screen, check this off. Three battle, uh, three battle palettes. This is a newer change that I haven't dived into as much, but if you have, if you find a ROM somewhere that you decide to edit and put some different, uh, God, what you call it, different palettes on there, and if you ask around the Discord, people will be able to put you better than that. Check this on, and that will activate those. And then suddenly, your party members don't just have to look like they have two colors and black on them each. They can have three, ooh, 8-bit technology. Um, team Tyra versus Team Steak, which is a tried meme, but just the same. This means your Tyras look like dinosaurs. This means your Tyras look like steaks. If you want the default music, no music shuffle is what you want to have on. That leaves all the game sounds the same. Standard music shuffle uh, just kind of moves it around but doesn't make it too crazy. Uh, nonsensical music shuffle means you could be walking around the overworld to the victory fanfare. And disabling music means that you can play the game with just whatever you want to listen to in the background, but you'll still get the game sound effects. Um, and if you are affected by some of the uh, old NES style screen flashing super fast, like either it gives you a headache or worst case, worst actual episode, uh, you can click this and suddenly walking over fire ice tiles, you'll still get the sound, you won't get the screen flash. And you can save these preferences from time to time. But yeah, based on that, like I said, there's some presets if you want to play with them you can tweak them how you want to you're welcome to leave any questions that you might want i'm going to be putting this on youtube as well and there's other videos to come on this but this is probably one of the longest ones because this is going to walk through everything and man i took a long time but that's okay this is asher hope somebody out there finds this helpful 
Final Fantasy 1 randomizer, definitely worth checking out. Definitely look for the Final Fantasy 1 randomizer Discord. Lots of friendly people there willing to help. Thanks for watching. Leave any questions in the comments, or you can just message me in general, and we'll do this again soon. Take care.